The hello, Robbie. Hi, Paul Winkle. What's this all about? I don't know. I think John's giving us a fluids test. No, I hate tests, Rocky. So do I, Paul Winkle, but hey, let's see if we know any of this stuff about fluids. Okay. Hey, Paul Winkle. What about viscosity and flow rate? Do you know how they're related? Uh, uh. Oh, Winkle, why are you eating? I don't know. How about something really different? Let's find out what these are. Uh, okay. Viscosity refers to the thickness of a fluid. Flow rate is a measure of how fast a fluid pours. No, you mean like, uh, like water and uh, pancake syrup? That's a good example, Bullwinkle. High viscosity means a slow flow rate. That would be your pancake syrup or molasses. Low viscosity would be juice or water, and that has a fast flow rate. No, hey there, Rocky. I think I get this. Good job, Bullwinkle. Number two. Give three examples of fluids with high viscosity and three examples of fluids with low viscosity. Uh, didn't I already give you some examples, Rocky? You did, Bullwinkle, but let's see if there's some more. High viscosity could be syrup, honey, or oil, crude oil. Low viscosity would be water, cooking oil, or vinegar. Yay, we're done the test. Not quite. I think there's some more questions. Oh, Winkle, what is density, and how do you find the density of a substance? Duh, I haven't got a clue, Rocky. Okay, let's take a look. Density is the measure of how much mass something has per unit volume. Density is calculated by the following formula. Density equals mass over volume. We could also say D equals M over V. Density equals mass over volume. Okay, what's next, Rob? Well, we have a question. What is the density of a log with a mass of 25 kilograms and a volume of 40 meters squared? Don't forget, full wingle, density equals mass over volume, or D equals M over V. Hey, Rob, I got a house built out of logs and frostbite balls. <laughs> full wingle, focus on the science test. No, uh, okay. So, full wingle, we go 25 divided by 40, and that gives us our answer 625 thousandths kilograms per meter squared. Oh, okay. I'm not very good at math. That's okay, Bullwinkle. As long as you know the formula, I think we should be able to get some answers. How does particle theory explain different densities? Uh, yeah. Bullwinkle, stop drooling. Okay. I have no idea what you just said. I said, how does the particle theory explain different densities? Nope, got me. Let's take a look. According to the particle theory, different substances have different sized particles. So substances with larger particles have a higher density. Is that it? I guess so. So, remember, when things are larger, they have a higher density. Uh, okay, that seems simple enough. I guess I'm more dense than you, Ralph. You certainly are, Bullwinkle. You're a moose and I'm a squirrel. Uh, I did know, I did know that. Okay. Using the particle theory, Bullwinkle, describe a solid liquid and a gas. I think I know this one. A solid is uh, something where the particles are packed close together and can only vibrate in place. Liquid, the particles are grouped in small clumps and move around faster. A gas, the particles are completely separate from one another and they move around very quickly. Good job, Bullwinkle. 
I was just reading what you had here, Rocky. That's all. Okay. Let's try another page. Little Winkle, what's the difference between quantitative and qualitative observation? I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, then let's take a look. A quantitative observation is an observation that is made by measuring something. For example, measuring the density of a brick is a quantitative observation. A qualitative observation is an observation that is made by and it's made by looking at the object or by tasting or smelling it. I like smelling things, especially tasty food. Go, Wango! For example, a person's hair color is a qualitative observation. That didn't really make any sense to me whatsoever, Rocky. Okay, but just try to remember, okay? That when we make a quantitative observation, we're measuring something, okay? Is it heavy? Is it light? A qualitative is when we're looking at something. We're describing it. We're tasting it. We're smelling it. Uh, okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. What's these next words, Rock? That's buoyancy and buoyant force. Well, I have no clue what that is at all. Okay, let's take a look. Buoyancy is the tendency for something to float. Buoyant force is the upward force which causes something to float. Okay, so buoyancy means I can float. When I'm floating in Frostbite Falls River, then I am floating, that is, I am being buoyant. That's correct, Bullwinkle. And the buoyant force is the force which pushes up and causes me to be buoyant. I guess so, Bullwinkle. It sounds like you know this stuff. Boy, I'm feeling like Albert Einstein already. <laughs> We're almost done, Bullwinkle. Find the buoyant force acting on each object in this example. Don't forget, Bullwinkle, force equals mass times 9.8. And 9.8 means newtons, okay? So, force equals m times 9.8. Uh, again, Rob, math is not my strong point. That's okay. Let's give it a try. We've got a 75 kilogram canoe floating on a lake. What's the force, Bullwinkle? I don't know, but I hope it's a pretty big canoe that a moose can get into it. Bullwinkle! Sorry, Rob. All right, let's take a look. What we do is we take the mass, 75 kgs, and multiply it by 9.8. The answer will be 735 newtons. Hey, Grade 8, try that. See if you get the same answer. Let's do one more. A 4,000th of a kilogram leaf floating on a swimming pool. What do we do? Remember, force equals mass times 9.8. So, and it's hundreds, thousands, four thousandths of a kilogram times nine point eight, or nine and eight tenths. There's your answer. Let's see if you can get that, okay? Phew! I'm getting awfully tired of science, Bullwinkle. Me too. I thought we were doing math. Bullwinkle, pay attention. Okay. Describe each state and explain what happens to the particles in the substance. Again, Rob, I have no idea what you're talking about. Basically, Bullwinkle, I want you to tell me what melting is, boiling, freezing, condensation, and sublimination. Sublimation. I have to say it right, Bullwinkle. Yes, you do, if you're going to be a scientist. Okay, melting occurs when the material changes from a solid to a liquid. The particles speed up and break into small clumps. Very good, Bullwinkle. Boiling occurs when a material changes from a liquid to a gas. The particles move very fast and become completely separated from each other. Look at you go, Bullwinkle. Freezing occurs when a material changes from a liquid to a solid. The particles slow down and move very close together. Way to go, Bullwinkle. Condensation. This occurs when a material changes from a gas to a liquid. The particles slow down and move into small clumps. 
There's lots of clones. Sublimation and material changes from a cellar to a gas without passing the liquid state. Way to go, Bullwinkle! Oh, I don't know any of this. I'm just reading this board. Okay, fair enough. Oh my goodness, there's one more question. Do you want me to answer it, Bullwinkle? Okay, Ruffy. What is pressure? How does it change when you go deep under the water or high in the sky? I'm feeling pressure right now to get this test done, Rock. That's not the kind of pressure we're talking about, guys. All right, Rocky, you give me your answer now. Okay, pressure is a force which is placed on an object. Pressure increases as you go deep underwater or high in the sky. Oh, yeah? Well, can you describe how a simple hydraulic machine works? You know something, Bull Wiggle? I think I can. A hydraulic machine is filled with a liquid. Pressure is placed on one side of the machine. The pressure carries throughout the machine. The pressure is placed on the fluid, results in a force being output. This force is used to complete a task. I have no idea what you're saying, Rocky, but boy, you sure sound good saying it. Now, what is a mnemonic system, and how is it different from a hydraulic system? Can you tell me how they're similar? Oh, Bullwinkle, a pneumatic system uses pressure on gases. While a hydraulic system uses pressure on liquids. Both systems are similar because they involve applying pressure to a substance. And that is all, I believe. Let's check. Oh! Bullwinkle, there's one more question. Okay, give me two examples of hydraulic machines and two examples of the pneumatic machines that are used in everyday life, Rocky. Okay, Bullwinkle. Hydraulic systems include the jaws of life, which firemen have to help people out of cars that are smashed, household plumbing, and even the human circulatory system use hydraulic systems. Oh, yeah? What about pneumatic systems? Bullwinkle, that's kind of easy. Car, truck brakes, airbags, and even dentist drills use pneumatic or gas-driven machines to help them get the work done. Oh, Rusty, I'm so tired. And then we just have one more thing to say. Let's invite our friend over here. Ebony, 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 that's right. That's all, folks. Ha <laughs> <laughs>